Hello, everybody, and welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. John Schmelk, Lance Meadow with you. It's all brought to you by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. Big show today. We're going to be joined by Anthony Broom, who covers the Michigan Wolverines for the On3 Sports Network at thewolverine.com. That's going to be at 1 o'clock. Just warn you guys ahead of time. There are a lot of Michigan <laughs> players. There might be Just more Michigan players in this year's draft class than I've seen from any other team in any other class. So we're going to have to go through it quickly. We'll do a couple extra on J.J. McCarthy off the top because that's such a big topic. But then it's going to be basically one question and out for the rest of the guys. So we'll try to focus in on what we want to find out about these guys, and we'll lock in on that because otherwise we'd be here for an hour with Anthony. He doesn't have that amount of time for us. So um, he'll be with us at 1. Until then, next half hour, we'll take your calls at 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. Not sure if you read it, Lance. Uh, Joe Shane, I guess, I don't know if it was an interview, but Albert Breer in his Monday football column or Tuesday football column featured the Giants pretty heavily. Um, yesterday, and they had some quotes from Joe Shane in there. Uh, the one notable one that's been floating around was, you know, everyone keeps thinking we're taking a quarterback. We have other needs. At the same time, he didn't shut down a quarterback either, which basically leaves us exactly where we've been for the past two months. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this is the season, John, where everybody is sending out mixed messaging because they don't want to give away how they're feeling or what direction they want to go in. So Correct. there's only so much you can read into this commentary. But as we mentioned, the Giants are in a bit of a wild card position because if some quarterbacks fall that are intriguing to them, you and I talked about this late last week, perhaps that changes the direction the Giants want to go in. But if the quarterbacks go early and often, as we're assuming right now, that still benefits New York because then they could be in position to grab one of, if not the top wide receiver that they have on the board. So I think overall the Giants are in a good position. And the last factor, of course, is maybe there is a quarterback or two still around. The Giants are not interested and somebody wants to make a move up and the Giants feel they can take a few steps back gain some extra assets, and not remove themselves from grabbing a game changer or a difference maker. So overall, you're not going to see a lot of activity because I think the Giants are in a position where they got to wait and see what happens early on draft night. And Washington has done an excellent job of not tipping their hand as to yeah. what they're going to do. And I think the Patriots have done a really good hand of not tipping what they're going to do. We've heard nothing but unsubstantiated like oh I'm hearing from other people that they think the team's going to do this but there's been no sources indicate this team's going to even like select this position though we assume Washington is going to take a quarterback sure but maybe the Patriots want to trade down there was some noise about that at the combine so you're right until we know what those two teams are going to do there's no way any sort of trade-up can be made ahead of the draft I was talking to Thomas Dimitrov that's going to go up on the Giants Little podcast today and I asked him like what are you doing at this time of year he basically says look I'll call every team 10 spots in front of me and 10 spots behind me. And I'll tell them, all right, would you be interested in this move? Okay, well, maybe give like a ballpark of what you're talking about. And okay, yeah, that might be something we could do. But then you got to wait till draft night and then you got to file yeah. it away. You keep track of what you kind of make a list. All right, if I'm moving up to this spot, I'd be willing to give up this. I'm moving back to this spot, I'd want to get this. And you look at the resources of each team in those spots and you figure out, what those trade packages would look like, and you kind of have those ready. So when you get on the clock on draft night and you have to make those moves quickly, you've already kind of set a little bit of a basis for what your goals are in those trades, but you've also talked to the opposing GM and you know what they're thinking a little bit too. So you can kind of bring those trade packages together a little bit quicker. Otherwise, with that 10-minute clock, Lance, it gets very, very tough. Well, that's why, to your point, you got to lay the foundation early. Once the foundation is laid, then you'll be able to put together those trades relatively quickly. So if you do want to make a brisk move, you're not send you're not sitting there and wasting five to ten minutes on getting the parameters of the deal in place. So that's why Thomas Dimitrov is basically telling you what every GM I would say is probably doing over the next few weeks that they're trying to decipher, okay, who perhaps would be willing to move with me in the event that we want to make an aggressive transaction. You do that. You do your homework. You do your due diligence well in advance. So the one thing I will add is if you did listen to Brian Kelly, he may have insinuated, I don't know if you heard his comment in passing, that Washington could take 
Jaden Daniels. But then yeah. again, there's only so much he can read. It was just he was being interviewed. He might have and he sort of dropped that in. Yeah, it was kind of at yeah. the end, and you know he'll be a really great player for Washington. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 for the league, right? Yeah, the league. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So I heard that too. So that's another little tidbit that everybody's trying to piece together. And but also, what? go ahead. I'm sorry, I, yeah. I didn't mean to jump on you, but um, if I'm New England. I probably feel a, I feel a little bit better about Drake May playing up in the cold in New England than I do Jaden Daniels, I think. He's a little bit of a bigger guy. I think he's got a bit of a bigger arm. I have to look at their hand sizes. I Just by looking at the guys, I'm assuming Daniels has a bigger hand size. I don't know. I'll have to double-check that. But I, I just feel like maybe it's, it's from seeing Josh Allen operate in Buffalo. I feel like that guy with the bigger arm and the bigger frame sure. can operate a little bit better in, in – in the outdoors in the colder weather. No, that's a fair point. But, you know, I think once again, when you're drafting a player, there's only so much that you can read into the weather. Of course. Given the fact that we have also seen players that played in warm climates be able to adjust. I'm not saying necessarily there's a quarterback that jumps into my mind, but players at other positions too. I mean, hey, wide receivers got to catch the ball in bad weather, and they may have been in an indoor facility for half of their college career. So I think at the end of the day, to me, what the film says, the skill set needs to be the guidance much more so than the little bit of concern or worry that if you move them into a different environment, of course. it's not going to necessarily pay off. No, it's a valid claim. I'm not disputing what you're saying shouldn't be discussed, but I guess I don't know. If I really love Jaden Daniels, I guess my point is, John, I don't say to myself, well, the weather is a reason why I should now sell myself on Drake May. I would say, you know what? We like what we see out of Jaden Daniels. We've had conversations. We've talked to his coaches. I think he can make the transition. Because here's the thing when it comes to the NFL, too. You could go to a warm weather climate. You go to a cold weather climate. You're still playing eight to nine road games every season. Okay, let's not forget right. about that. So it's not as if you're going to put your quarterback in a bubble and say, okay, we're going to make sure that we navigate the schedule accordingly, that everything is going to be perfectly in place to be suitable for 50 degrees and up. You're going to get into cold weather situations. It's going to snow late in the season and you're on the road going yeah, to Western too. New York or whatever it may mm -hmm. be. So that's another reason why I don't necessarily read so much into that. I agree with that. And Jaden Daniels, for the record, has 9 and 3 eighth inch hands and Drake May has 9 and 1 eighth. So Jaden Daniels well, there you has, go. has him by a full uh, quarter of an inch there. So. And if he grows his fingernail a little bit longer, ah. perhaps he has an edge there too. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, again, didn't mean to get too deep into the weeds there. So let's take your calls, folks, because we're not going to have any time after 1 o'clock. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. We'll continue to do prospects this week and next. Um, and then uh, we're probably going to do, I think, a mock draft on Friday is right now what we're leaning towards with Lance, Paul, and myself. We'll try to get all the way to the Giants' second-round pick to give you an idea of who's going to be available when you get to round two. It'll probably be the only time we do that this year. Maybe we'll do another one the week of the draft. So make sure you tune into Friday's show for that. Let's go to Donnie in Queens. He will lead us off today. Hi, Donnie. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking the call. What's up? Hypothetically, Giants take a quarterback at six or they move up for a quarterback. I think we would all agree that if that's the case, Ultimately, this is this guy's going to replace Daniel at some point, right? They're not going to use that capital there and and not replace Daniel with that quarterback eventually. I mean, you would you would think yes, but if Daniel Jones comes out and, and plays like unbelievable, like All Pro level football, then things get interesting. I mean, keep right. in mind, so, Donnie Jordan Love, right, was drafted by the Packers, and it took him a few years till he fully took over for Aaron Rodgers. So it's not crazy sure. to think that you could wait potentially till year three of the rookie contract to make that transition. But needless to say, Donnie, if you're picking a quarterback at six, you're going to expect him to be your starting quarterback within a couple of years. Yes. Yeah, I mean, sooner rather than later. Yeah. By and large, he's not replacing Aaron Rodgers, and he wasn't drafted in the 20s. But uh, generally speaking, that's how you, it usually works. Yes, of course. Wouldn't the prudent move then by the Giants be to do their best to take advantage of the rookie salary post-June 1st cut Daniel, not risk him playing this year, kind of like we've seen Denver and Oakland do the last couple of years, and have that injury guarantee kick in for 2025? and just let Drew Locke start the season until you're ready to hand the reins off to the new quarterback? I understand what you're saying with that. I don't think that's the path they're going to go down. 
Well, that's a different thing. I, I'm saying that would be the prudent decision to do. And I, I not if you're not if you're trying to win football games this year. It's not. Well, that's almost like it's kind of like spiting yourself because I Don, mean, Donnie, you, uh, Donnie, I'm going to give you insight into how a football team thinks. Winning games is never ever in a bajillion years spiting yourself. It's just never. Uh, that's I'm just I mean, telling that's you. True, that's though. how that's teams think of. That's how teams think about it. Uh, Brian so Dable's job is Donnie. Brian Dable's job is on the line. You think he wants to go out there and purposely play worse players to lose football games? Well, I mean, I would be assuming that they think that those players are significantly worse, that they would affect the outcome. But sure, I mean, I, I totally get it. But that's why you have a general manager and a front office to have a direction of the franchise and take that out of the coach's hands. No, I understand that. How, how do you think the relationship between Brian Dable and Joe Shane would go if Joe Shane did that to Brian Dable? I mean, look, I, you would hope that they'd be on the same page and that, first off, Brian Dable shouldn't be in a spot where he's coaching for his job specifically based on win-loss records. If the organization takes a turn where they're deciding that they're taking development over short-term gratification that leads to nothing. So that, that's a flawed thought Well, well Donnie, well, Donnie time out. It, it doesn't necessarily lead to nothing. When either Daniel Jones plays great for eight games, then you can trade him next year and get something really good back for him. I mean, look, that, that, that would be great, but I think there's more likely, based on the history of his play, that he gets, injur- gets injured, has no value, and then it's just a uh, you know, wait around your, your cap for next season. I get that. But... I, I'm just basing it off of his career. His, his, his career has been bad outside of one season where it, it wasn't even all that great. So, well, it's just a hypothetical. I was curious what you hear of it. I mean, I understand, like, the, the organization is always going to say we're, we're trying to win, but in the reality, it's not every single team is always 100% putting their best foot forward. And if the organization does take a quarterback, what they should be thinking about is future development because this upcoming season shouldn't matter. And if they're going to hold that against the coaching staff, they're already doing because that's an organization that's not on the same page. Well, Donnie, but remember, I, no, but Donnie, hold on, hold on, hold on, Donnie, let's have a conversation here. Now, just yeah. keep in mind that might be the organization things, but outside pressure builds on stuff like this too, right? This is a, um, this is a, you know, you have to look at how people from the outside are looking at things and how the, the fan pressure is. Um, you want to avoid that sort of stuff. Um, and again, you get some benefits, and again, I think if you get if you you start Daniel earlier in the year, and then things don't go well, and the season's not going right, then if you want to, you know, take that precaution in terms of that injury guarantee, I understand going down that road. I I, I just think making that decision that early in the process, I just I just don't think that's what the team's going to do. And you talked about Russell Wilson, right? When did the Broncos make that decision? No, they did that late in the year. Plus, they did it late in the Derek year. Derek Carr is another good example, too. And when did they make that too. decision with Jimmy Garoppolo? Late in the year. When yeah. did they make the decision with Derek Carr? This would yeah. be, Donnie, literally the first time I can remember in the history of the league where this happened that early in the process. Well, you make that right. decision, and I'll let you continue, Donnie, but hold on. You make that right. decision. Those examples is basically when you're ready to move on from the quarterback. You don't want the player to get hurt, so you want him to be more appealing to the rest of the market. That's what the common element with all those examples is. I don't think the Giants gave Daniel Jones that contract to now all of a sudden bury him and worry about the injury. They may need to look for another quarterback to protect themselves in case he gets hurt, but that's different than the those three other teams who got to the point where they wanted to move on from those signal callers. So I don't think it's the same conversation. Well, I would agree it's not the same conversation because those teams didn't have, theoretically in this situation, a, a top 10 draft pick that they just added to their team, potentially traded up for, that they, they already had the in-house replacement. Whereas, you know, Denver was basically at this point, like they had nobody else to play. The Giants would have locked to short, for the short term, hold down the starting job until they were ready to put the rookie in. And that's really what you're selling your fans on anyway. Uh, so it's, it's really not a comparable situation there. They, those teams had nobody else to play. Yeah, but Donnie, you, so, can't, you can't give me one comparable situation in the history of the league when a team did this. Well, this is a relatively new thing that's been happening, though, also. So there's not a huge sample size of it either. Well, that, that, uh, they, they, Donnie, that's true. But again, I don't think you're – and again, you aren't getting any other – aside from the injury guarantee, you're not getting any other – tangible benefits from doing this. And I can't imagine them making that type of move when your only tangible benefit is something that might not even end up being a benefit. Because remember, if Daniel Jones sprains his ankle or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, what, does something in week three and he's out for eight to ten weeks, he's still going to pass his physical at the end of the year, right? So, so then, then the injury I, I guarantee wouldn't kick you. in. 
I was going to ask you, do they have to be able to pass the physical by season's end? Is I be- that what it is? I believe that's the rule. I, yeah. You know what, Donnie? That's a really good question. Yeah. I, I'm assuming that's the rule because that's when that sort of thing gets decided, but I'm not positive about that. I mean, I, could think, I, I, I believe then two out of the last three seasons, Daniel Jones would not have been able to pass the physical at the end of the season. So, look, is, is it certainly something outside of the box? It is, but I would say this. In particular, this I'll hang up at this. Yep. If they trade it up, let's say, right? Now you're giving up multiple you – know, you're giving up future picks. They really want Drake May, and they can get him at three, right? You're really going to need your cap space the following season because you have now traded into your draft capital of next year to get this guy. In that particular case, I would really suggest that that would be a possibility to think about because they're going to need that money now to surround this quarterback next year. Well, no, look, look, Donnie, look I, I, look, I understand what you're saying. I don't mind thinking ahead like that. But remember, I, 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 don't, I, have, I have to look at what that – I'm not sure what the published details of the contracts are. I, I think it's, what, like a $20 million injury guarantee or something like that. Yeah, if you spread that over the two – The money they would say by cutting him would go away. If, if you spread that over two years, right, you're only looking at $10 million a year. That That is not – I, I'm not sure the benefit of saving that, which is you're looking at, what, 5% of the cap, maybe a little bit less than that even, depending on where the cap is in, in those two seasons for two straight years. I'm not sure that's worth what the, the, the drawback you would have from the message you sent to your team in the locker room, the losing games, and frankly, you know, just— They've been losing with Daniel. <laughs> they made, Donnie, lost. Donnie, they made the playoffs and won a playoff game two years ago. I know, but that's one out of, what, five seasons? That, that was an outlier. He, they've been losing with Daniel, so I don't think it sends a message about winning or losing, but I'll just say I this. I think it absolutely guys... does, Donnie. It absolutely does. When, 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 I mean, when, look, when, when, when the team views opinion. a player, no, I'm, I'm telling you what the locker room would think. When the team, when your locker room has your starting quarterback and your team purposely jettisons that player before the year, pure, and by the way, players are going to be pissed about that too. You see players, uh, you see a team handle a contract like that with injury guarantee, that's also going to make other players in the locker room mad because you're not – a lot of players will see that as you not handling the contract fairly. They're going to see that as a message that you're not doing everything you can to win football games this year, and that is not the message you want to send to a locker room of players that have to go out there and risk their life and livelihood every week to play games. So to me, that $20 million, that, again, you can spread over if, if you want to you – know, you can put dummy years on the contract or whatever you want to do to spread that out over a couple of seasons, that – to me, understanding how the internals of an NFL building work, the benefit is not worth the cost in that situation. Again, you get to week 10, you get to week 11, and you're out of it postseason-wise. You can't make it. Can we have this conversation again? Absolutely. I'd be totally understanding if you want to have that conversation then. I don't think you can have that conversation in May. Well, I mean, the other thing is you, you can't just bank on having the rookie, let's say, who takes Daniel Jones's place, the only guy on the depth chart. So there's still value in holding on well, yeah, to Daniel. There, but yes. Well, but I think you feel a lot better with Daniel Jones being the insurance policy. Case in point, the Niners moved up to get Trey Lance, and there was all this talk about you can't keep Jimmy Garoppolo on the roster because he's going to be a distraction. They kept Jimmy G, and then Trey goes down, and they needed Jimmy Garoppolo to come in. So I would not subscribe to this thought process, Donnie, that just because you do make the transition and you use resources to move up that you absolutely have to then part ways with the guy that may have lost his starting job because I just named you an example where they kept the guy who lost his starting job and he proved to be valuable and they made quite the investment in Jimmy G for an additional year. So it can work sure. like that as well. And, you know, anecdotal and a guy that took them to a Super Bowl, some kind of apples and oranges. Well, now, but, but my, my overall, my guys, overall point, fired. though. No, no, Donnie, depth. go. Donnie, no, that's go. Fine. Appreciate but the call, man. Thank I, you for the call. I, I mean, Good call. Donnie is focusing on the resume of the quarterback. I'm focusing more on the way general managers think is even if you draft a quarterback, John, if he doesn't have any NFL experience on his resume, you can't right. bank on him being a savior overnight. Right. You have to have somebody else. God forbid that guy goes down, just like the Giants were in a precarious spot when Daniel Jones went down. So I think we learned across the board this year. Year, how many starters went down? Oh, how many was, teams more than half the league. were then ill-prepared right. because they did not have another option? So I'm not a believer you make the transition and then you move on. There may be value in holding on to the guy, especially if you have money, to your point, bottled up, and you're going to have to spread the money out across the board for the next two seasons. To me, you might as well hold on to the guy and get some bang for your buck. Yeah, I, I just don't think you can make that call that early. No, I, absolutely I just think not. the message yeah. it sends to your fans and, and the players in the locker room 
him. I just don't think it's a really good message. Well, I mean, forget that stuff. To me, I just don't think it's a practical move for the right. sake of your roster. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm looking at it. Yeah. I want as many options at my disposal. It's no different. I don't want to get off topic, but the Stefan Diggs move, for example, okay? The reason, personally, I don't like that move is, John, my feeling is, would you rather have Stefan Diggs on the roster or would you rather have $31 million in dead cap space to watch him play for the Houston Texans? Well, I mean, you, you're you only gaining $3 million, yes. But how much more well, money are you going to have next year because you took the hit this year? I under, But then I got I to gotta see what the pros and cons are of having that flexibility for next season and what it does for the team. I'd personally rather have the proven commodity My in Stephon Diggs. My thought is that they That's saw the player play. declining and they wanted to get out earlier than later. Well, I mean, they could get out after next year. I understand you may not save as much money. I would just, I'd rather hold on to a guy that's no, had six straight 1,000-yard seasons than watch him in the conference play for the Texans and digest a $31 million cap. Hit. There might have been more going on. Oh, I'm sure there is. That we know but, about. but I'm but talking no, about I on the totally, surface. I totally get what you're saying. From a financial yes. perspective, that's how I'm thinking. The Buffalo Bills are certainly a worse football team today than they were before. Without a doubt. I mean, they have no, no vertical threat on the roster anymore. Correct. Yeah. All right, let's go to Hugo, who will be our uh, final call here before we get to our Michigan reporter, unless Hugo goes really fast, which usually doesn't. Hugo, what's going on? Yeah, I, I'm going to try. I'm going to cut my comments down and try to go really fast. Uh, and John, I hope you're not getting uh, draft fatigue. I don't know how you do it. You're, you must be going 100 miles an hour all the time. But anyhow, uh, you know the process has played out. I just wanted to talk about my favorite day one players. Um, and they're not necessarily the guys at the top of the board, but sure. my favorites. Um, Malik Neighbors, Quinion Mitchell, Troy Fautanu, and uh, Jackson Powers Johnson. I like them all. So I'm, I'm going to tell you what my nightmare scenarios are. All right. Nightmares, nightmare scenario number one. Now, you got to be honest with you. I wish Paul was on here for your nightmare scenario so I can see him get Ajita as you give them, but <laughs> I will deal with that as best I can. Okay, I, I, I think they're reasonable nightmare scenarios. So, uh, nightmare scenario number one, the Giants trade up uh, to take, call it the fourth quarterback. I'm thinking the name that comes to mind is J.J. McCarthy. Okay. Where I, I just don't see him. I, I mean, at six, if he falls, I guess I would be okay with it. But you're really kind of re reaching, you know, he's kind of like a, call it a late first round talent. So even at six, I think that's a reach, but certainly trading up would be one nightmare scenario. Nightmare scenario number two, somehow Neighbors does not fall to six. Um, and um, a couple of things happen. Quinion Mitchell drops to 15, and the Eagles trade up and take him. And then either Troy Fautan or Johnson Powers Johnson make it to Dallas. Yeah, and for some reason, either. Hugo, I don't understand why, but Jackson Powers Johnson the last couple of weeks and the guys falling, that right? and the guys that do mock drafts that have contacts in the league, right? So you can tell that they yeah. talk to people in the league and they get feedback from teams about the their mocks. Jackson Powers Johnson has slid into the second round in some of these drafts, which I don't that, get that, it. That, if you watch his tape and I watch him at the Senior Bowl not lose a rep for two days, I, I that doesn't make any sense to me, Hugo, but I have seen that. I think there might be some medical stuff going on in addition to just the hamstring, but I have seen that. I, I can't explain why because I love the player. Well, well, Dallas needs a center. Miami needs a center. I, I, I'll believe it when I see it. But, but, um, and here's the thing. So. Dallas usually kind of um, – foreshadows their that, pick like it, it usually gets leaked out who Dallas is going to pick and it really sounds like they're either going to pick Graham Barton Jackson Powers Johnson or Tyler Guyton those seem to be the three guys that have been really connected yeah. to Dallas also. and I mean I'm looking at an NFL.com mock draft those guys are all projected to go in the high 20s in that area yeah. all these players that we're talking about and that's in the area of Philly <laughs> Dallas Pittsburgh Cowboys and so forth so look, one hot spot on the on the roster. You guys have talked about it. Is a three technique. I'm underwhelmed by this class. One guy that I find I find intriguing, and I think you guys have alluded to this guy, is Mason Smith, because to me he just he's just a kind of a, a Coach Patterson type guy, right? With the long arms, knock back ability, physically imposing. So if you look at what they've done with Riley and. You know, what Patterson's talked about with respect to Leo and Dex, he almost fits the mold as opposed to, you know, the guy from uh, with the short arms from Florida State. His name uh, escapes me right Brayden now. Fisk. 
Yeah, Brad Braden Fisk. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. F- so, F- Fisk is. Do the, you think Fisk is the smaller, undersized guy? Mason Smith can play three technique, but he's a humongous human being. He's a humongous guy. So, so the question is, the because I've seen him all over the place. He's in he's in Jeremiah's top fifty now. Do you think he can make it to the third or fourth round, John? I think Mason Smith will be off the board. Huh? Uh, Mason Smith might get to the Giants' first third uh, first third round pick. They're only third round pick because it's so early in the round. Mm-hmm. But he he to me is a traits pick. I actually like Makai Wingo's tape better than his. His teammate at LSU, mm-hmm. but Mason Smith has yeah. all the check boxes on the size and exactly. the weight. And he was a yeah. he was I think might have been the top uh, recruit in the nation the year he came out. Then he tore up his knee and yeah, he hasn't he got really hurt. recovered to where he wants to be. So uh, I would say I would say he's probably going to get picked anywhere between pick let's say. 50 and 70. Why don't we put him in that range? Okay. So you kind of have to cross your fingers if you want to take him in the third round. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's fair enough, John. I'll, I'll let you go. All right. Uh, All thank right. you, Hugo. Appreciate the call. And, you know, I said this multiple times. I understand people get obsessed with positions by round, but, you know, A, they've got two young interior defensive linemen on the roster in Jordan Riley and DJ Davidson. So you got to see what Shane Bowen thinks of the two of them. And, you know, this is what happens when you get caught up with a specific player and you're hoping that he falls and then he gets taken much earlier, which happens left and right. I mean, it's funny. You brought up Paul. That's what Paul gets obsessed with, right? He gets caught up with players and then the bottom line is they're nowhere to be found by the time the Giants get ready to select. So you got to be careful when you get overly fascinated with a player or a position because you don't know where the Giants have a lot of these players also on their respective boards too. And Shane Shane Bowen did a little ride along with Sean O'Hara. You can see it. And one thing he says that he wants guys that can change the line of scrimmage and penetrate pretty much. And sure, well, look at what he had up front in Tennessee. That speaks to me yeah. as, you know, to pair with Dexter Lawrence at 340 pounds, maybe he would favor that smaller penetrating type guy like a Braden Fist, like a Makai Wingo, like a Michael Hall from Ohio State. Um, I think those are the type of smaller upfield guys you would talk about in that situation. And Michigan has one of those defensive tackle prospects that we're going to talk about as well that is a little bit bigger but certainly can be in the mix for the Giants here if they want to draft a defensive tackle in the middle rounds. And what seems like two dozen other guys, we're not going <laughs> to take a ton of time on all of them, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a lot of them. And now we're joined here on the phone for our guest today. He covers Michigan football for the, Wolver- the Wolverine.com and on three sports network. He is Anthony Broom. Anthony, you got John Schmuck and Lance Meadow here in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Hope all is well, man. How are you? Everything's great. Uh, thank you guys for thinking of me and for having me on. No, nah, appreciate it. Uh, appreciate you doing it on short notice, by the way. So I want to start with J.J. McCarthy, Just and I, we'll do a couple questions on him, then we'll kind of motor through the rest of the guys because there's so many. When you watch J.J. McCarthy, and I think Daniel Jeremiah has referred to him as an acquired taste, and I thought that was a good way to put it. Because watching him on TV, I watched, I don't know, a half dozen, seven Michigan games this year. You're very underwhelmed. Then I dug into the All-22, and I was more impressed. I think he did some stuff that was really impressive. His third and long stuff was really good. But based on what you've seen, on what they've asked him to do in his tool set, Anthony, do you believe J.J. McCarthy has it in him with development to become a top seven or eight quarterback in the NFL in that category of, you know, Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, Aaron Rodgers, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, you know, those type of supermen that can put a team on their back on any given Sunday and win a football game? Yeah, I could see it because uh, he was a guy that, sort of was that for Michigan, you know, within, you know, what that offense is, you know, we, we know that they're, they're physical. They like to run the football, but you know, the, the narrative that Michigan, what they had around him propped him up and that it wasn't the other way around. I keep, I keep pushing against that because you look at the early stages of the Jim Harbaugh era at Michigan and, you know, it was a lot of quarter, you know, the, the offense was the same, but it was really the quarterback play that takes you to that next level puts you in the contention for college football playoffs and national titles. And, you know, again, I know that people get bogged down with the uh, lack of production, so to speak, but people tend to forget, too, that this is when you watch Michigan games from this last year, I think they went their first nine or ten games where the starters weren't even playing into the fourth quarter. So um, not even the same amount of requisite amount of, you know, competitive snaps early on. You know, J.J. McCarthy, to me, I think – um, you know, watching him over the last three years, you know, the arm talent is there, the mobility is there, the improvisational skills are there. And, and when you talk about some of those unicorn type of guys that, you know, you're asking if he can be in that mold, I mean, he has that, that it factor, that rising tide 
you know, to him where he's he's the guy that lifts guys up around him. And I think that really uh, he checks enough boxes to me where I actually think he might be one of the safer quarterback picks in this draft. Um, when you talk about variance, you talk about the personality. I, I just think you get him in the right system. Um, he really does have a chance to pop. So for me, yeah, I do think that he has a chance to um, to emerge in that the mold of some of those elite guys. And uh, it's been kind of interesting to see the country catch up to a lot of the things that we've seen over the last three years in Ann Arbor. My only follow-up on McCarthy, and then I'll let Lance take the rest of them on the quarterback. You mentioned get him in the right system. What to you is the right system for J.J. McCarthy? Yeah, I think um, probably something similar to what he played at Michigan, where you know you, you're good up front on the offensive line. You know, you've got the running game to, to control the clock. Um, you know, I think a lot of what he does well. Uh, and Michigan didn't run as much of this as I thought they would this year, but I think he's the type of guy that can feast in those play action type of situations. So, uh, to me, you know, again, a lot of the knocks against him are, you know, quote unquote, his role in the Michigan offense, but. Um, they were running as pro style an offense as anyone in college football was last year. So, to me, I think uh, I do think there's a lot of scheme versatility in what he brings. But uh, he's he's had a lot of a lot thrown at him. But I think that you know that those physical type of football teams that can run the ball, move the chains, keep the clock moving. I think that uh, that's probably where he's at the best. It's interesting you mentioned that, Anthony, because a lot of the teams, as you well know, that pick early in the draft usually have issues in those areas. So you just wonder if there is a team like a Washington, a New England, even here with the Giants, where he could come in and have that offensive line and that run game. I think that's something that teams have to take into consideration. He'd actually be fortunate if the Vikings trade up for him. Correct. They have a much more ready-made 100%, roster 100 percent, and the Vikings are a little bit later on yeah. in the draft, so that's my point. Now, you mentioned that the numbers don't tell the whole story, and I'm with you there, Anthony. One thing that I want to examine more is the turnovers, and they're very low. The touchdown-to-interception ratio definitely jumps off the page. Nine interceptions in the last two seasons. He clearly has a lot of zip on the ball. Do you feel he took enough chances from what you've seen over the last few years, or is that more of a product of what Michigan's offense asked him to do, and because of the large leads, he wasn't put in a position where he was in a precarious spot and had to press the envelope? I'm curious your perspective on that. Yeah, it might sound like a bit of a cop-out, but I think there's validity to all of that. Uh, I think there were always inherent kind of Maybe training wheels aren't the word uh, with the offense that they ran at Michigan, but, you know, a, a lot of it is, you know, a lot of what they preach is being efficient and making smart plays. But, sure. you know, when you have a weapon like a J.J. McCarthy, you do have to let him uncork it. And there are times where, again, you know, talk about the, um, you know, didn't really have a ton of interception problems. Uh, really, it was only a couple games. You know, uh, the college football playoff game against TCU last year, which, again, one of the biggest games he's ever played. Um, they, you know, Michigan gets down early and he has to lead them back and, you know, make some mistakes on his own. And, and there was a non-conference game against Bowling Green where he threw three picks this year. But, um, you know, I, I think that they did a really nice job of letting JJ be JJ while also making sure that they weren't taking a ton of chances. But again, you know, when there's a lot of times where you see him roll out and he's got to find some, you know, it turns into that playground football and, him and Roman Wilson kind of feasted when that's what it became last year. So, um, again, there, there are some throws on tape where he gets it through two or three guys, and you have no idea how it got there, but it did. I mean, there, <laughs> there's a lot of those risky type of plays. Yep. Uh, right. I think of the Ohio State game last year, the Michigan State game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think he has taken those chances, but, um, again, just with the way that those games are played, you never ha really saw him – you know, rip the ball 35 times, 40 times in a game and have to, to lead them back a ton. So I think that's a valid uh, concern for anyone. We just haven't seen a ton of it. Last one for me, Anthony, on J.J. McCarthy, because, you know, you're embedded in the Michigan community, and you know we go through these storylines every single year where there's at least one quarterback that I would say is a bit polarizing. You hear things about he could go extremely high, and then all of a sudden it doesn't match what we see come draft time. Trey Lance comes to mind. He then went high as the Niners went after him. There was a lot of talk that maybe Mac Jones would go higher. He falls to the Patriots at 15. What are you hearing? in Michigan about J.J. McCarthy and the validity or the substance behind a lot of buzz that seems to be surrounding him right now? 
I think it's extremely valid. Uh, I think a lot, uh, you know, a guy that I put a lot of stock into his opinion is, uh, you know, Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl, who's actually a Michigan alum. So uh, he's kind of been pounding, pounding the table for NFL teams being much higher than, you know, draft Twitter, as they call it, or some of the other, um, you know, evaluators out there. I think that uh, when you look at, again, all the boxes that we've discussed that he kind of checks off, uh, you know, the, the production or the numbers, all that does to, you know, if, if I'm an evaluator, that makes me dive in deeper and see why that is or, or what it is. You know, a guy like Mac Jones put up video game numbers in that Alabama offense a couple of years yep. ago. And, you know, obviously a lot of that had to do with the talent that was around him. And, uh, you know, again, J.J. McCarthy had talent around him at Michigan, but just, you know, really different, uh, super different. So to me, um, I think it's extremely valuable. I don't think it hurts that you have a now sitting NFL coach in Jim Harbaugh who – has talked this guy up as potentially the best quarterback in the draft every time someone's put a microphone in front of them. Um, but I, I think when you when you talk about the Jim Harbaugh's of the world, you know the Jim Nagy's of the world, some of these other draft analysts who say, "Hey, listen, man, like he is. This is not just a, a flash in the pan. You know, Michigan had one good year, and he was the quarterback on a national title team. I mean, they're." There's a legitimate skill set here uh, that's moldable, and I think you get him in an NFL system that um, you're going to see him even pop a little more because I, I think his best fo- football is very much still ahead of him. And when you're evaluating a draft prospect, I think that's maybe the biggest thing that allows a guy to rise up boards with the type of tools that he has already. All right, Anthony, I lied. I have one quick follow-up. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, just one, one super lightning quick question. He was a five-star crew, right? Like, coming in, he was one of the top – recruits in the whole country correct as as a high school quarterback in college i think he was right on the fringe of that four or five star okay. maybe a top top 30 guy whatever it is so, got yeah. it okay perfect now my thought now my my bigger follow-up is the one thing on the pick on tape is i agree i think he throws on the move really well his third and long stuff was great throws over the middle very accurate on those crossers good zip on the ball i didn't see i've watched every one of his dropbacks this year to, to be prepared for this draft process I didn't see a lot of touch throws on the tape, and I thought his deep balls were a little bit flat, and, and they weren't necessarily, you know, I think on the level of, of some of the other prospects. Watching him beyond this year, how many touch throws have you seen him execute and, and, his, and his vertical throws going over the top? Do you see that as a legit nitpick, or do you think that's nonsense? Uh, I think it's. I think there's validity to it, um, you know, especially on some of those outbreaking throws to the left, uh, even at the combine. Uh, he sort of struggled with that stuff. So, um, to me, I, I think that's where, when we talk about the lack of pass attempts relative to his peers in the class, I think that's where that's maybe a little more of a concern is that not as many opportunities to hone that in. Um, you know, Michigan, you know, maybe would only take one or two shots at a deep ball, if that, uh, in a game a lot of times. So, I, I think that deep balls never quite, you know, despite the skill set, never quite honed that in consistently. Um, and touch on his throws. Yeah, he needs. He likes to throw fastball, but yeah. you know you got to oh, be yeah. able to throw a change up. You got to be able to mix it up a little bit. And um, that's where I think I, I just think more tailored quarterback coaching at the NFL level is something that maybe helps them unlock that, or it doesn't, and they have to scheme around it. So uh, to me, I think again that is a valid criticism. Also, because those fastballs can bounce off of receivers' hands on the NFL yeah. level and lead to interceptions, which clearly he doesn't want to see increase given how good his ball security and his decision making was on the collegiate level. Let's stay on the offensive side of the ball. You brought up Roman Wilson, one of his biggest targets. Clearly, the production is there with 12 touchdowns. He's a speedster. There is even commentary that I have seen that maybe given the run heaviness at times of this Michigan offense, that they could have got even more out of Roman Wilson. Where do you stand on his fit on the NFL level and whether or not he even scratched the surface, Anthony, of his potential ceiling? Yeah, I like him a lot. You know, when you talk about his speed, I think it's a little more straight line than it is, you know, the phone booth, the the quick, you know, the short area stuff. Um, You know, with him, I I know a lot of people have sort of compared him to maybe like a Tyler Lockett type, which I could see. I mean, a guy who I think is a really savvy route runner, uh, we'll get physical too. I mean, they say at Michigan, no block, no rock. So you're gonna, he's gonna be a guy that'll get out there and, and open things up in the run game as well. So, yeah, just a really well-rounded uh, receiver prospect who, you know, coming into this year, uh, had never really had a totally healthy uh, season at Michigan. I know he had, uh, I think, uh, prior to this year, 
Uh, he had, I think it was a leg injury and then a concussion that he dealt with. So, um, you know, this was his most consistent season. And, you know, as the year went on, we started to see him be a guy that they more kind of, um, you know, defenses would account for. And, um, again, we talked about, you know, how important it was for J.J. McCarthy to, to flash in kind of that scramble drill type thing. He's a scramble drill wide receiver. I mean, I think he's really good at finding ways to get open. I think he's got a knack uh, in the open field. Obviously, some, uh, you know, he's got the yak ability as well. So, I, I think that he is, you know, talk about guys that can pop by getting into, you know, a more pass happy level of football. I think he's going to be a really solid slot receiver for someone, and he could play maybe the outside just a little bit. But you know, as someone who works out of the slot, a la you know a Tyler Lockett or um, Christian Kirk, you know, I, I think, think is he, another good one. Yeah, yeah, guys like that I think make a lot of sense in terms of comparison. So um, you get him in the right. You know, with the right quarterback, the right offense, I think he's going to be a guy that sticks around for a long time. Yeah, look, I I, I think you absolutely hit it, Anthony. Uh, you know, more of a vertical slot than that, you know, old school Wes Welker side to side quickness type guy. I'm with you on that. Uh, I'll combine two guys into one question here. The other passing targets. First of all, I can't wait for Lovecraft to come out next year. Wow, that guy can play tight end, but we don't have to waste time on that now. Uh, mm-hmm. A.J. Barner, uh, give me your little thumbnail on him. And then I was really impressed by Cornelius Johnson at, at the Shrine game that in Frisco I was down there. I talked to him for about five or six minutes. I think he was a really mature kid. And I wonder if the lack of a vertical passing game in, in the general scheme like you spoke about really hurt him a little bit because to me, he's a field stretcher. I didn't think he'd run as fast as he did at, at, at the combine. He ran a four 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 if I remember properly. But I, I think he has a little bit more to give just given the nature of that Michigan offense and his lack of usage as a target. Yeah, I think there could be some more there. Uh, a, a, you know, a solid maybe fourth wide receiver, third wide receiver in an offense. Uh, to me, you know, when you look at Cornelius Johnson, I, I know there's a, there are people who said, oh, well, you look at the athletic profile and uh, other Michigan wide receivers that have looked like that, like a Nico Collins, like a Donovan Peoples Jones. I don't quite see that. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I think he's probably just a tick below both of those guys, but um, I was surprised to see him run a 4-4. Uh, we never quite saw that type of speed at Michigan. Um, you know, at times a guy who not quite as crisp running his routes as he'd like to see, mm-hmm. uh, some concentration drops here and there, but a guy that, you know, whenever the one thing I'll say about him too is, whenever he made a mistake or whenever some you know some sort of potential was left on the field with the play, he typically was a guy that paid it back with interest um, and, and did it in big games too. I uh, like the Ohio State game a couple of years ago. Uh, had some big catches in you know in the college football playoff this year. So, yeah, I like him a lot. Um, you know, again, it's uh, you know both of these wide receivers. You know, people say that oh well, Michigan. You know, JJ McCarthy was. Didn't, you know, he had this great offensive line, great running game, but the skill players have been probably underrated. And, and you throw A.J. Barner in a list like that as well, who um, I thought flashed a lot more than I thought he was capable of as a blocker, a little more athletic than I thought he was as well. Um, and, again, talk about the production and, you know, having a guy like Colston Loveland in the room takes away from some of that production, but I could see him getting into, you know, fitting pretty well in someone's system as well as, you know, number two, number three, tight end. So a lot of quality guys there. Maybe no one who's going to be a superstar or a featured piece, but you know, a lot of good role players on that Michigan offense. What about at running back, uh, Blake Corum? You know, you look at his numbers, and he was a touchdown machine. But I think, Anthony, a lot of people are looking at him, and they're wondering, does he have enough flash at the NFL level to do more than just take it in from five yards out where do you see him fitting even if he's part of a running back committee I guess is what I'm getting at on the NFL level yeah I think he has a role with someone and you look at a team like the Chargers and we rack our brains sure. who from Michigan is Jim Harbaugh going to pound the table for and I feel like he's going to be at the top of that list um you know he's a guy that he came in as a freshman and was more uh, sort of that lightning type of back in this Michigan offense, you know, playing along Hassan Haskins. And then Haskins goes to the NFL. Corum puts on some weight to kind of bulk up for the more short yarded stuff. And I think sacrifice a little wiggle, uh, a little speed by doing that. But, um, you know, what we've seen from this offseason at the combine, you know, he'd slimmed down. He's been running routes out of the slot uh, for teams. He did it at Michigan's Pro Day. So try, a guy maybe trying to show that he's a little more versatile than. 
you know, feasting from the one yard line or the two yard line uh, would suggest he is. But the one thing, I mean, he is, I think his, you really started to see him in the later stages of the year, like the Ohio State game, the college football playoff, kind of get back to what that, you know, his elite film from the season before was. And, you know, coming off the, the offseason knee surgery and the recovery from that, I thought that um, they did a really good job not only keeping him fresh, but then when it was time to go and they needed him to, to show out in a big game, he was ready to roll. So, again, it, you know, it's so tough because you weigh in or, you know, you, you measure in at whatever it was, five, seven and a half. And, you know, it's just everyone at the line of scrimmage is just so much more big, so much more athletic at this level. So, you know, it makes you wonder what his role might be. But, you know, if he, he can catch the ball in the backfield. We saw him do it as a freshman. He did it a little bit this year. Um and I think with him dropping a little bit of weight, I think he will get some of that speed back. So, uh, to me, I, I think he has a role with someone, and at, at, you know, whatever team that winds up being, I do think he's going to be part of a, a effective backfield rotation. Yeah, I'm with you. I was going to ask you if if you did see improvement from that injury over the course of the year, and it's good that you did. I, I I'm, I'm with you on that. All right, I'm going to consolidate here. Michigan have a lot of offensive linemen <laughs> coming out. They're led by Zach Zinter, who, who's coming off that gruesome leg injury at the end of the year. Trevor Keegan's in that mix, too. Then they have a bunch of other guys. Can you give me just like a little thumbnail on each guy in this group and, and which guys you think stand out to you? Yeah, Zinter's obviously at the top of that list. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a gruesome injury, but he's got a metal rod in that leg now. So the way he's, you know, he's said it a few times, he'll never break that leg again. <laughs> um, and he's a guy, too, where – you look at him, and I think if he stays healthy, you're probably looking at him as like a day two type of prospect. So, to me, I think there's there's going to be probably some pretty good value there, and he should be should be football ready uh, in a few weeks based on what he told us at Pro Day. So, uh, from there, I think Trevor Keegan, uh, again, just really solid, well-rounded uh, guard prospect. I think that um, maybe a little bit of swing ability, too. He played a little bit of left tackle uh, due to some injury stuff, I think, last year. Uh, so Keegan, I think, uh, can be a nice little maybe sixth, seventh offensive lineman. Drake Nugent, a little undersized at center, but a workout warrior, a guy who's you know, extremely smart, comes from Stanford, transfers into Michigan, and they don't skip a beat there uh, from Olu Olu with Timmy the year before. And then you have the guys like Carson Barnhart and uh, Darius Henderson and Trent A. Jones. Where I think I kind of lump them all into the same category. I think they all played – about the same last year, but they're all, you know, they were guards playing tackle. And I think that when you look at where they fit at the next level, it's going to be at guard. They're going to be probably those fifth, sixth, seventh round type of guys that maybe teams even ask them to snap a little bit. Uh, Carson Barnhart said that a few teams had asked him about that. So uh, versatility with those guys, I think good solid depth pieces there. But, you know, when you look at the, the strength of this class, it's, it's Zinter and, and it really seems like medically, there are a whole lot of concerns about him uh, in terms of his recovery. It's just being able to do everything, up, you know, leading up to the draft is, uh, you know, the lack of that is pushing him down a little bit. But, uh, yeah, that, that was the heartbeat of this team. And I think that uh, those inter, I, I think, will be a, probably a day one starter or at least, you know, a, day, a year two starter for somebody. I think he's that good. Anthony, let's flip over to the defensive side of the ball. Junior Colson, linebacker, a lot of talk that he could be a three-down linebacker in the NFL. Clearly, his numbers were consistent on the tackling side, though it is interesting. Seemed as if he had more assisted tackles than solo tackles throughout his career on a yearly basis. And the reason why I want to hone in on that is if we project him to the NFL level, do you see him more of a cleanup guy? Or do you see him as a guy that could handle his own load if they put him out on an island? How would you best assess that? Uh, I think he's probably more of a cleanup guy, um, especially you know in coverage. I think that he leaves a bit to be desired. Uh, you know, I've saw him bite on a lot of run fakes at Michigan and kind of have teams go over the top of his head and, and things like that. But um, you know, he's he's a solid well-rounded guy and someone that I know has been talked about as a potential day two guy. Um, you know, Colson to me, I think is another guy where I think in a lot of ways still growing, um, you know, still learning the game, even with that three years of experience at Michigan, you know, did a pretty nice job manning the middle and maybe even an understated part of that defense with, you know, just how good they, they are up front and not all, there wasn't a whole lot to clean up at the second level. So, <laughs> sure. um, you know, for him, I, I just, I, I think that, 
I, I don't know if he's an every down linebacker in the NFL. I think that he's a guy that certainly can help you with run support. And I think that he's, you know, you know, you talk about those green dot guys. I think, that, yeah, I, I don't know if he's quite that, but I really do. I think that, um, you know, with what we saw, just a, a really well-rounded guy that is not really going to be out of position a ton, especially when it comes to cleaning stuff up. So uh, impressed with what I saw from him. Joined by Anthony Broom, covers Michigan football for the Wolverine.com and on three sports network. Uh, Anthony, I loved watching Mike Sanchez still. I understand that, you know, maybe the overall top speed though he ran fine at the combine isn't what some people crave and the size is only five, nine. I get all that, but boy, that guy anticipates you could tell he studies tape. He knows where the team's trying to go with the football. He makes plays on the football. Um, he's not one of these corners that 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 can't catch the football and, and bring it back the other way. I think whatever team gets Mike Sanford still is going to get a really good football player that's going to play for a really long time in the NFL. I, I just wa- I love watching his tape so much. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he's if he's the best non McCarthy prospect uh, out of Michigan in this class. I mean, a guy that. You know, from day one, you know, they lose Daxton Hill to the NFL. He flips over from wide receiver on a suggestion from, from Jim Harbaugh. And he just, he, he's always looked like a natural there. And um, it got even better this year. You know, he led the team in interceptions, um, had some big ones throughout the year. Whenever they needed someone to make a play on defense, he was that guy. And there were, you know, there were a couple of times, Will Johnson, um, who I think is probably going to be a first round pick in next year's draft was injured in that Ohio State game. So then you have Mike Singer still kind of doing battle at times with Marvin Harrison Jr. I think he holds up pretty well there. Obviously held up well, you know, against a pretty good tight end prospect in Cade Stover each of the last two years. So to me, it's it's not just how natural a fit he's looked at nickel. It's that his best games on tape at Michigan have come in those big showdown type of games, Um, you know, especially against Washington and the receivers that they throw out there. So, um, a guy who's just never out of position, um, you know, not afraid to get physical. I think that he can play a little bit outside. Um, I don't think we'll see him do a ton of that because he didn't at Michigan, uh, but it's something that they they did mess around with there. And again, I, I just I, he's just so well rounded a prospect. You know, the all of the numbers. You know, none of the athletic testing is really going to blow you away. I think he ran like a four five five or something, but. The man is just so instinctual, and, and when you get to the football as quickly as he does, I mean, that, you know, I'm not as worried about what the testing numbers are because I know when you flip on the film, he knows where he needs to be. So yeah, I, I think I, I think he's going to be one of the better, if not maybe the best players from this Michigan class that makes it to the NFL. Well, you mentioned the six interceptions. He returned two for touchdowns. He's got that opportunistic feel in him. And I think there's something to be said. We've seen this on the NFL level. Guys who play wide receiver and flip over to defensive back, I just think they have great instincts because they see the field through the other lens. Trayvon Diggs of the Cowboys is another guy that comes to mind that made the switch. So I'm with you, Anthony. I think I wouldn't be surprised at all if he turns out to be the best prospect aside from McCarthy. Now, Chris Jenkins has very good bloodlines because his dad, by the same name, made quite the name for himself up front. And his uncle, former giant Colin Jenkins. Absolutely. So that Jenkins family has spread the wealth across the board on the NFL level. You look at his production, Anthony, and I think it's misleading because I think people look at, well, he doesn't have a lot of sacks, but he actually seemed to still cause disruption up front with his pass rush, and maybe there's more to eat off the bone, perhaps, on the NFL level. How do you see those dynamics in play that maybe the numbers, the stats, don't do his game full justice in what he did at Michigan? Yeah, I think the best of what Chris Jenkins does are things that, don't show up in a box score. I think the way that he takes on some of the dirty work on, on a defensive line, um, you know, not at all unlike Mozzie Smith last year coming yeah. out of Michigan where, um, you know, the traits are there and, and, you know, guy, you know, someone who's been on Bruce Feldman's freaks list, but you look at the numbers, you're like, oh, wow, he only has X amount of tackles or this many sacks. Uh, to me, I mean, Chris Jenkins was really kind of the straw that stirred the drake for that Michigan defensive line, you know, freed up the edge rushers uh, to get to do what they had to do. And, you know, you put him in the NFL. I think he's, you know, in the NFL, probably more of a three-tech where he's may, maybe playing a little more of a nose when he's at Michigan. But, um, you know, as a guy, you know, you pair him with the right defensive tackle, 
I think that's a guy that has a ton of pass rush upside that we haven't seen yet. So, to me, I think Chris Jenkins uh, we had one of the – obviously one of the better combines at defensive tackle. Um, you know, at Michigan they called him the mutant because he is so <laughs> freaky at whatever it is, 6'3", six, 6'4", three, six, 300 pounds. You know, he's a guy – when he got to Ann Arbor, he was at like 235 and just kept putting on weight and putting on weight to be this athletic disruptor in the middle of the defense. So, to me – um, you talk about all these guys that have a chance to still play some of their best football. Uh, he would be in that group as well. Well, Wolverine is part of the X-Men, so I would say nah. that's fairly fitting that Mutant gets thrown around as a nickname as well. I want to go to the two edge rushers, uh, Brandon McGregor and Jalen Harrell. And they're both kind of in that undersized pass rusher, you know, edge player outside linebacker mold. Which one of those guys do you think has a little bit more juice, a little bit more upside with the best chance to succeed at the NFL level? Or do you put them both roughly at the same level? Uh, I prefer Jalen Harrell to the two of them. Uh, I think when you put on his film from Michigan, he's a guy that not only you know has, has rushed the passer and did a good job doing so, but you know he sets the you know sets the edge in the run game. Um, he can drop back into coverage. I think that he's made a lot of you know a lot of big plays you know during his time in Ann Arbor. And, you know, there's there's versatility there. I think that you could do a lot with him. He was sort of kind of a Swiss Army knife. So um, I like him, you know, as, as a depth guy, as someone who could maybe, you know, could maybe play, you know, Sam linebacker. He could maybe rush from a three-point stance. That he was kind of asked to do a little bit of all of it. So uh, I like Jalen Harrell just a little more from a versatility standpoint. Uh, Braden McGregor is a guy that, you know, after Aiden Hutchinson left, he put. Uh, you know, McGregor in, in football pads, and it kind of looks like, you know, he's off the same conveyor belt, but <laughs> never quite reached that level of, you know, not quite the athlete. Um, you know, I think he racked up a lot of pressures, but I think probably could have, could have finished more plays at Michigan. Um, I, I don't see as much versatility there for him as I do with a guy like Harrell. So Jalen Harrell, of those two guys, I think uh, maybe has a little brighter NFL future. Well, there were only 18 Michigan players invited to the Combine, so I guess I'll wrap up with this question, Anthony. I mean, I think we covered the meat and potatoes of this class, but anybody else that may be under the radar that was not brought up, even if you don't think they're going to be drafted? Remember, there's opportunities for undrafted free agents to maybe make some noise that has the potential that maybe is not being talked enough about. Yeah, someone like... uh... I mean, God, there are so many guys. You almost you almost forget a couple <laughs> names here and there. Uh, Josh Wallace was a guy who I thought played very well in the college football playoff. Uh, you know, against Ohio State, talked about how he had to take on a little more uh, when Will Johnson went down in that Ohio State game. I uh, thought he played solid. I don't think he'll get drafted, but I think that you probably find someone that will, uh, you know, take a chance on him as a UDFA. Uh, James Turner, the kicker. Uh, you know, maybe not quite the same level of kicker that Jake Moody was last year getting drafted as a third rounder. Um, James Turner was incredibly clutch, clutch for them and hit some long kicks. He had a couple, of, you know, from 50 plus yards out. So I think that James Turner, you're probably going to see him in the NFL camp somewhere next year, uh, potentially competing for a job. So outside of that, I mean, I, gosh, there are so many guys. Um, I, I think that you know, anytime you cover a team that has that many players, you're like, Oh, well, I've seen them make all these plays. Of course, someone will draft them. Of course, <laughs> uh, someone will take a chance on them. I uh, would say I think maybe a few of the offensive linemen, like a Trent A. Jones, like a Carson Barnhart, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't get drafted. But even if you just take a couple names out of the mix there, you're still looking at a group that could set that record of, of 16 guys drafted um, after Georgia set the record back in 2022 with 15. So I, I'm going to be I'm going to be as busy as. Most huh. NFL teams sure. will that weekend, so that'll be fun. Anthony Broom, he covers Michigan football for the Wolverine dot com and the On Three Sports Network. Anthony, awesome stuff, man. Always, we got this through in half an hour, which I didn't think we would do. We did. Congratulations, to all three of us. <laughs> Excellent job. Um, tell the folks where they can find all your great work. Yeah, well, you can find uh, me over at the Wolverine dot com. You know, we are part of On Three and, and the ever expanding network over there. So. Um, we also do a monthly magazine. Uh, NFL Draft is in Detroit. So for us, quick drive over from Ann Arbor to maybe get down there and, and take some of that in as well. So uh, we will be as as thorough as anyone when it comes to covering this NFL Draft from a Michigan perspective. So 
um, yeah, encourage people to, to come on over and check it out. Anthony, great stuff, my friend. Appreciate the time and joining us on Short Notice. We'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks so much, Anthony. Of course. Thank you, guys. Anthony Broom, Wolverine, thewolverine.com. Make sure you go check that out. I wonder if they had to fight Marvel for that one. I don't know. That probably would have been some battle royale in terms of royalties so, and so forth. So, yeah. so something tells me Marvel has more of legal firepower <laughs> a little bit to more that pull. battle. Yeah. Just, just yeah. say it. Something probably. tells me they probably have like 17 attorneys on retainer yeah. to uh, handle perhaps a smaller operation that happens to cover Michigan football. Though, I didn't think about it. If there's any year for the draft to be in Detroit, this is the year with all of these Michigan players. It makes sense for them to be on full display it in does. their own backyard. So I hope you guys are able to absorb all that. Uh, maybe only one first-round player, believe it or not, from the national champion, which is not common. Usually you'll get more than one in that situation. There's not even really, you know, and I said Lovecraft, by the way. I meant Love Lind. They're a big star tight end. He could be a first-round pick next year. He's a really good player. But, you know, it's just kind of an all-around team that got put together that played a certain style and played the right way that's how they're able to win it there's not a ton of star power but there are going to be a lot of day two michigan prospects but that quality are dominate day, day two, two. Guys. correct yeah. yes so i mean that to me is the upside well coached team harbaugh has nfl ties and you know that if you're looking to round out your roster i think you could find some quality guys especially you know some of these offensive linemen that we were talking about a lot of starts under their belt or even he brought up trent a jones he's intriguing because he barely started john but there were flashes that he showed when he got in he only had 13 starts over the course of his career but he has a profile that if you get him in the mid round that maybe he could find the spot or be a swing type of guy on the NFL level so I'm with you it may not be top heavy but I think there's substance and quality in this class and then by the way you know Ladarius Henderson's going to be a day three pick uh, yeah. Barnhart's going to be a day three pick so there's just it's just a lot of guys that are going to get picked up and down the board and you know the type of player you're getting because they're coming from a Jim Harbaugh coach team well and that to me is the biggest point of emphasis plus you brought him up Cornelius Johnson Mr. Contested Catch you mentioned the sample size is small, but hey, if you need a big red zone target or a guy that is going to get X amount of snaps, he may be extremely appealing at some point in the draft for a team looking to add a little bit more size. Because, I mean, we joke on this program all the time, you can't teach height. Well, he fits that bill, and I think there is more to tap into I agree. because of the limited opportunities that we were discussing earlier. I'm with you. Lance, good stuff, my friend. Absolutely. I Indeed. believe tomorrow it is That would be Paul and I. and Paul. Is it the yes. next two days, you and Paul? I think it might be, right? Correct, yes. It's a switch, and then Friday we well, might Friday, take a, we may might do like if we do the uh, draft. Yes, right. correct. And Tennessee yeah. tomorrow based on the Tino's text from earlier yeah, today? Yeah, and a few other schools that we're working on as well. Okay. It's a group effort in it, terms of what we could potentially do milk out of tomorrow it'll be a cavalcade so, of, of yes. college prospects so guys another, look we're running uh, out of time yeah we're I tight man ticking here two weeks it's april 10th yeah Coming before fast you know and it furious, man. Well, and that always happens right yeah, know, you look does. ahead and you're like oh my god well, what because are you, you talk think the about? draft is so far enormous. away at the combine then free agency comes takes up three yeah. weeks or a month then all of a sudden that ends and you're like oh crap four weeks and then, like, it's on top of you like that. So make sure you stay tuned in uh, to Big Boo Kickoff Live again every weekday, 1230. Check it out. Lance, Paul, myself, Matt, Casillas, Cross. One combination or the other of our group will be with you throughout the draft. Uh, it's all brought to you by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the Giants. And while you're listening to the Giants stuff, go listen to the Giants huddle as well. A ton of great interviews up there. Uh, Thomas Dimitrov's going up today, former Falcons general manager, talking about uh, the process of this time of year and, and how a GM tries to evaluate these players, including the quarterback position. So we've gotten the, you know, the analyst on the quarterback position. We got the former quarterback, Kurt Warner, talking about evaluating college quarterbacks. Now the GM. So I really think we've hit every single angle on how you evaluate quarterbacks in terms of process and just what they think of the guys. So make sure you go check it out on the Giants Huddle Podcast. And the latest draft season is up as well. Make sure you check that out. Tony Pauline and I go through our top tens on offense for each position in the draft. It's Tony's top tens, and I get to criticize for him and tell him, yeah, you're wrong about this. And <laughs> I don't have any skin in the game, so it's fun for me too. Uh, for Lance Meadow, I'm John Schmelk. Thanks for joining us on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Giants.com slash tickets for season tickets. Download the Giants app for all our video content. We'll see you next time on Big Blue Kickoff Live.